the workplace. So we want to be able to facilitate conversations around AI plus careers. What does this mean for you? And how can you leverage this technology to create opportunity uh, to succeed in what will be a new economy? And a, a huge part of what we uh, are focused on at SCSP is making sure the public sector has access to the right talent in the right place at the right time to harness AI and then also to upskill the workforce to use AI. So that's two parts to that conversation. I am so excited to welcome to our stage, uh, stage for today while we get our official stage ready, two amazing people who are doing such incredible work to bring AI talent into government. Uh, and uh, you're both uh, helping lead two incredible programs uh, that are really focused on this initiative of tech to gov you have embraced the AI executive order that put a call to action to bring AI technologists into government at early and mid-career stages. So I'm so excited to get to hear more about your programs and more about what you guys are uh, lining up in terms of the, the problem sets your, your teams are working on. So let's just jump into it, if that's okay. Instead of formal introductions, I'm going to ask you both a question. And that is, we want your AI plus career story. <laughs> so I'll start with Chris, because you're right here. Uh, please tell us about your journey. How did you start the US Digital Corps? So Chris Quang, US Digital Corps, Marissa Levine, Presidential Innovation Fellows Program or PIF Program. Um, tell us about, we'll start with Chris, and your AI plus careers journey. Yeah, um, thank you, Diana. Thank you to SCSP for hosting us and uh, for everyone for spending a Tuesday afternoon with us. Um, as Diana mentioned, my name is Chris Kwong. I help lead a program that's fairly new. So if you haven't heard about it, no hard feelings. It's <laughs> called the United States Digital Corps. It's been around for about three years now at this point. And our mission is to recruit and hire early career technologists, so new and recent graduates. I know we've got a few in the room. Congrats, everyone. Um, in technology, so whether that is AI and AI enabling fields, I'm sure we'll dig into it, but also software engineers, product managers, designers, cybersecurity folks. And we're structured as a two-year fellowship program. So folks come with us out of school. They spend two years working on high-impact projects across the federal government. And at the end of that time, we actually have built in a mechanism through which folks can convert into a permanent position in government. And so uh, we really built this as a kind of first rung on a career ladder, if you will, of, hey, test out what public service could look like. I know in, in some instances, preaching to the choir here, a lot of public servants here already, but kind of test out what working on these types of issues could look like in government. I've been with the digital course since the beginning back in the summer of 2021. Before, Jared, you heard a little bit, I um, was a part of a nonprofit organization called Coding It Forward that had a very similar mission. Instead of hiring recent graduates into government, Coding It Forward was really focused on creating internships because at that point we found that, um, hey, there's a lot of good work happening in government. There wasn't a huge emphasis on bringing in people who were fairly early in their career, let alone people who were just looking for something to do over the summer and test things out. So um, that was really motivated by, I was a student in undergrad and I think I learned about a lot of the programs that we'll talk about and got really excited, but realized, hey, those opportunities for early career folks didn't exist. And so got really lucky, had some great mentors, was able to build a nonprofit organization that ultimately was able to kind of bring in hundreds of people and give them kind of a meaningful first taste of public service. Uh, when it came to um, more advanced tech skills. So I will admit just up front, I do not have nearly as much technical background as probably <laughs> anyone here in this room. And so my focus has always been like, how do we find people with those skills and put them in positions, as Diana said, where they can have an impact. And I think the more I travel the country, the more I talk to students, I talk to recent graduates, I hear often this notion of, hey, all of my peers are all, like on a path to go into the private sector, or that is just the default in so many ways. And, and I'm thinking about ways that we can break that cycle, right? Elevate what a public service career could look like. And uh, been lucky to 
been able to do that with both the coding at four and now the digital four. So really excited to dig in. Um, we have stood on the shoulders and learned a lot from Marissa and team at the Presidential Innovation Fellows. They've been around a little bit longer, but I'll let you talk a little bit about your background and what it is you all do. Awesome. Um, well, the, right back at you, Chris, for watching you guys build something really incredible and learning from you all at the same time. Hey, all. Uh, my name is Marissa Levine, pronouns she, her. I serve as the director of, you'll hear me have quite a few titles. I like director of experience and events right now. Um, and I am on the PIF leadership team. Um, so we are a fairly small team. So I work with other folks, including our director of agency success, um, multiple supervisors, a deputy director, and more than 60 fellows currently. So there is not a single boring day, um, which I think those of you who work in government know. And I'm about to hit my four-year mark in federal service, yeah. which is anything I ever put on. Um, but I think we'll get to that part, which I actually kind of love. I'm a walking use case in what happens when you get here and realize that the work is incredible and the people are even better. Um, I also come from nonprofit work before this. Um, I was at Coding It Forward. I'm not sorry, Coding Forward. Code for America. I feel like I worked at Coding It Forward with Chris. I was at Code for America prior to this. Um, and a lot of my career has been in convening. Um, I'm an event producer by trade, and I love to connect people and ideas and all of the dots. I think that there are so often ways for us to collaborate with each other, to work across silos, to work across aisles. And that is one of the things that I bring to the PIF program. Um, but I joined really to continue to engage both the PIFs in their experience um, at the fellowship, as well as to continue to engage with the outside world. Amazing folks like Diana at SCSP, um, other folks in the private and um, nonprofit sectors as we think about where talent can come from. And really just to continue to boost the what Chris said, public service is a pretty unique opportunity, but it's often one that folks don't think about right off the bat, especially if they're somewhere else. Um, PIF is, we've been around since 2012, so about to hit our 14th year, 12th year. I'm great at math. <laughs> also not a technologist by trade. I refer to myself as an expert generalist. I can have a conversation with most of you about what you do, but I am not the AI person. Um, founded in 2012, then CTO Todd Park, I think pretty infamously, I think stood on a stage at TechCrunch and basically said, help, uh, we need people. We need people to come into government and work on really sticky technology problems. Um, fast forward to 2017, when PIP was actually signed into law um, under the Talent Act. It was President Obama's last act as president, actually on Inauguration Day. So there's a fun Wired article if you want to check that one out. It's, we love that little piece of lore, but we're not going anywhere. Um, and PIF has now been a program across three administrations um, and has continued to support really vital initiatives across dozens of agencies. Similar to um, Digital Core, we are a fellowship program, but not fellowship in a unpaid kind of way. I think it can be sometimes a bit of a misnomer. We bring mid to senior technologists into government for one to two year tours of duty, which is a term that I know Defense Digital Service may be familiar with. Um, but it is a not, it's not a permanent role. It's a role you come into knowing that you're going to leave and knowing that you're going to be passing the baton. Um, folks come in for a one-year commitment um, at the GS-15 level. If you're not familiar with that, it's the kind of top end of the civilian pay scale. So it's a big privilege for us to be able to bring technologists in at that level. Um, and we bring them into the General Services Administration or GSA. Um, the agency that you may not know about, but has infiltrated most parts of federal life. If you work in government, we work on IT buildings and cars in case you are curious. And then we, uh, we bring in cohorts of 20 to 30 folks a year across multiple disciplines, product, software, data, AI, design, experience, digital strategy and transformation, and then send them off to other agencies who are having a hard time finding the amazing senior talent they need to tackle sticky problems. Um, quite often, and I don't know the lot, who's searched on USA Jobs recently? Who thinks yeah. job titles are confusing at best? <laughs> Yeah. It's nobody's fault, right? You know, hiring can be tricky in government and it's structured in certain ways for a reason. But if you're coming from the private sector, I'm an IT specialist in the background. That may not be the term you're searching for if you're a senior technologist trying to come into government. So part of it is creating an amazing place for folks to identify an opportunity to come in and serve, to serve along like-minded technologists and really have the benefit of a cohort to learn from and collaborate with. And coming back to what I love to do, which is convene and connect, the problems might be called different things at agencies, but they're really similar. And one of the best things that I think of the PIF program is that it's 64, I think right now, uh, phone of friends. 
on your computer waiting to tell you that they're working on something similar at their agency or they've tackled something like that in the private sector before. And to me, that's been the most incredible thing is seeing fellows jump to possible solutions or approaches so much quicker because they're able to connect with like-minded folks, both within our program, across our home. Um, Chris and I work on you know, sister programs. We have the same big boss at the end of the day um, and access other great technologists. So I think it's a perfect kind of germination spot for talented technologists to be to make an impact quickly. And that being said, the bug is catching. Uh, we see almost half of folks decide they want to stay and it's a choose your own adventure game for that one. But I was just actually tallying up folks. I know you're doing this as your folks confirm um, staying on and seeing just so many folks say, I'm not done yet. The impact is real and the work is fascinating. I come from Silicon Valley and I always say, you think Sacramento, scooters in Sacramento are a fun thing to tackle? Try healthcare for 300 million people. That's my pitch. So it's a great <laughs> Actually, and it gets into this perfect part of the, so lots to cover in terms of uh the mechanics of how you can get involved if you're interested what really makes a successful candidate thinking about the partnership aspect that is critical to what both of your programs do so there's two layers of this for me one is there are you are two of several fellowship programs mm -hmm. um you've got usds you've got dds um you've got the pmf program so for some people can you landscape how you interact with some of these programs and where you see yourself? Chris, you talked about, you know, really trying to be a catalyst uh, for early career professionals to really think about public service as a, a career for technologists. Uh, but, but also thinking about where you fit in the ecosystem of programs and then how you've been able to build so effectively, so quickly partnerships with agencies um, and, 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 you know, being able to work uh, across agencies on different mission sets. So would love for you both to comment on, on this partnership aspect. I think one thing that's interesting is thinking about the history. And so Diana mentioned some great acronyms. And I think one of the best parts of working in government is that everybody's got the same mission, which is better services for the American people. The competition is we just want to all do it well. So it feels a little bit different than when I worked in private sector. Um, the PIF is one of the oldest. So we've been around since 2012. And lots of our folks were involved in starting organizations like the United States Digital Service, which operates out of the White House in launching 18F, named for 1800 F Street, where GSA's headquarters are, which is another sister team of ours at Technology Transformation Services. And my first boss when I started here was, I think, the executive sponsor for Chris launching US Digital for. And so I think that we just need more talented people. So I think in terms of fitting in, every team has a slightly different approach to how they do their work. I think for PIF, as one example, we place folks as senior advisors, meaning it can be a pretty broad portfolio. You're there to kind of suss out what are the problems? How can we approach the problems? How can we connect dots? It's not a full stack consulting team. We don't go in, PIFs generally go in, you know, single or sometimes in pairs, or there might be a couple of folks at an agency, but it's not going in with a huge consulting team. There's no capture manager aspect for us. We want good things to happen and we don't care who we pass the baton to. It could be bringing folks from digital core on to support teams. It could be helping to do upskilling. It could be helping folks with a supported acquisition or finding the right contractors to work on something. So the goal for PIF is always to be passing the baton. We're not supposed to be there for forever. So question. Yeah, uh, so I think it's, it's, <laughs> I'll let Diana just handle this. Yeah, you ask question. No, Only I ask a question. <laughs> uh, so uh, we deal with a lot of fellows, interns, and capstone projects at uh, Ensign, and one of the biggest challenges we face is um, getting their not only clearance with, especially on the defense side, but also like data access mm -hmm. and trust on digital tools. You guys run into those problems also when you're trying to get your PIFs and uh, your fellows off the ground? Yes. And I think that one of the, and I, Chris can speak to this as well. I think it's why we're really fortunate to be housed at GSA. Um, so di different from other programs, I know that there's different mechanisms for getting great talent into government. And we see that I'm certainly not an expert on those. You can call HR somewhere else on that. But we hire fellows as full-time federal employees for their term. So when you come in, you're a badge GSA employee. There's no dash C after your name. You are not coming in from an external organization. You are a Fed. And then we do paperwork. 
more acronyms. It's called an IAA, an internet, uh, what does the IAA stand for, Chris? Inter I'm having a day. Inter 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 I'm having a day. There's lots here. of acronyms. There's so many, many acronyms. Tap Tap right. Right. If we say one, to yes. stop Block. us. Block. Block. Yeah, please hold us accountable to I have no problem that. spelling it out. Yeah. Um, so we, and then we send you over. So that's kind of the, the mechanism that we think works really well is that you're already a trusted fed. Like any other organization, clearances are going to take a little bit longer. Not everything is perfect. <laughs> um, and my pips would tell you it's not, but we really do our best to kind of have you hired as a fed. And it's a really similar model for Chris and digital Corp. Yeah. I think we benefit from some of what Marissa was talking about, but the fact that our folks are recent graduates mm -hmm. who tend to be younger, but not necessarily true across the board. And when it comes to a security investigation, that just linearly means there's less than <laughs> an investigator <laughs> potentially flying. Yeah, and so um, we also have, for, 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 for one reason or another, we haven't done as much work with the DOD or the intelligence community, just because that is a sticky wicket that we haven't fully mm. solved. Uh, most of our 20 plus partners are federal civilian agencies that are DOD represented. And so the vast majority of our projects are folks with a public trust level investigation and no more. Uh, we have been able to get people on secrets and top secrets, but uh, to Mercer's point, takes a little bit more time. We found that we can get people on an interim secret clearance pretty quickly in about the same amount of time as a public trust. Um, and that in almost all cases has allowed people to get started on work. But there are efforts kind of that are bigger than us in terms of how do you create unclass networks and unclass spaces where folks can play with data in a way that isn't plugged into all the, all the classified stuff. And uh, that is something that I think we run into just as much as others. Thanks. And I do think though, we also strive to bring in folks who know how to navigate that ambiguous time where you may or may not be settled in the right way. Not that it's a test, but we like folks who come in and say, okay, you know, maybe I don't have my clearance. What else can I do? Who else can I talk to? Where can I ask questions? How can I speed this process up? And so I think we've seen some pretty savvy navigators. Nobody's going to I know we just talked about a book called Hack Your Bureaucracy. It's not fully hackable. <laughs> um, but I think that that's another thing, you know, when you're thinking about coming in is that there's rules and there's figuring out how to navigate a rule even space to, to get to work on something, even if you're not quite fully papered or accessed yet. Thanks. I will say your programs, your programs have been very effective in figuring out how to bring people in quickly and how to get them moving on projects. I think quickly is a bit of a misnomer in federal government, but we try. <laughs> so maybe unpack that a little bit, um, because I think there is a lot of hesitation from people who would be potentially interested in entering public service, particularly technologists who get, um, you know, turned off by the traditional hiring process, whether it requires a clearance or not. Um, right. And so how are you able to effectively bring in people, but then how are you able to figure out which partners to, to match people with and, and, and what kinds of problem sets people would be best served to work on? I'll actually start and I'll toss you on the project stuff because Chris works more closely on a lot of our project matching. I actually want to give a really big shout out to the amazing talent team that we work with at TTS. I think it's one of the most candidate centric talent teams I've ever worked with in a place where it's really hard to do that. So if I don't know if Lee or Deb is managing to watch here, but there's a really, really big onus on making sure that the experience is taken into consideration, not just the outcome. And so I think that where federal hiring you know, you're working with bigger, clunkier tools. Folks don't always get the notifications they need. They really strive to partner with us on a high touch way to make sure that where possible, you know what's going on to help to smooth over that you may not know exactly what the process looks like to make things as plain language as possible in a world that isn't always plain language. And so I personally feel really lucky to work at TTS. I think it's a great place um, because I think there really is that emphasis, not just on following the rules, but using all of the other things that we have at our disposal to make sure that we can, I dare say, make it enjoyable. We get some pretty awesome feedback actually on working with our talent teams. Um, and we want that to be what it's like everywhere. Chris, I'll let you talk about projects though. Yeah. I think going back to the last question about agency partnerships right now, mm -hmm. we have 110, 120 fellows for the digital core. They're working across 20, 25 different agencies and 
at no point during the application process is there a, hey, name the top three agencies and their acronyms that you'd like to work with. Mm -hmm. I like to see a fellowship program, like some of the ones that we've been discussing, as almost a single front door Mm -hmm. of, hey, apply once and get considered for a bunch of different roles. Because the current way that we have set up the federal hiring enterprise is that the onus is on the candidate to go on USA Jobs and find each individual role at each office within each department at each agency that you might be interested in and have to apply to each one of them separately. And then you probably are tailoring your resume. You're going through all of these independent processes that aren't internally consistent across each other. And that can be a really frustrating and difficult experience as a candidate to navigate. On the other hand, a fellowship program, you could apply it to the digital core. You could apply to the PIP program. It's one application. You'll go through one set of interviews and screening and and selection. Mm -hmm. And at the end, at least for our program, you get considered for all of our agency partners. So it's apply once, be considered multiple. And I think that type of hiring approach is one that we've seen the federal enterprise take much more seriously in just recent months. Uh, You may see kind of postings that feature direct hire authorities. You may see postings that have something that that are called pooled hiring or shared certificates, which is, hey, we have one job posting. We're going to run you through one qualification process. And at the end of that, multiple hiring managers on multiple teams, and depending on the posting, potentially even multiple agencies, can all hire off of that one process. And so I think that when we talk about agency partnerships, when we talk about how do you get your foot in the door, those types of opportunities feel much more candidate friendly because then Mm -hmm. the onus is on the hiring manager and the agency to sell like, hey, if I'm the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, let me sell you with the candidate on why you should come work for me, while at the same time, the FTC might also be reaching out. And so the onus is on us to make an affirmative case instead of you as someone who maybe is looking to join government for the first time, needing to figure out what each agency does and how they're different and that just seems the dynamic is reversed. And I get really excited about that. But I would add the way- to that too, which is I think you don't know. I mean, I'm curious, like you don't, we don't have favorite agencies or projects, but there's an uncountable number of agencies in government. I don't think there's actually like a factually agreed upon number if you ask a lot Define of different agency. people. Exactly. <laughs> Which means that you have no idea what could be interesting, especially if you come from a really multifaceted career. If you're, I joke that trying to put a PIF in a category gets somebody to say, no, 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 I like all the things. I'm good at this and I'm good at that. And I've done a little bit of this. And so I think that we do some of the lifting with our partners in finding places that are going to be you know, fertile ground and have the right folks in there who want a PIF or a digital core person to come in and maybe open up your eyes to something that you've never even thought about. I think lots of folks have interviewed with us and said, Ooh, I didn't know that X agency did Y. I had no idea. Like yeah. who would have thought that that's the case? And I think that's also from kind of like a surprise and delight <laughs> angle on what your career could look like. That's really pretty phenomenal. All of our health folks who come in with health backgrounds don't necessarily end up at a health agency. They may have experience doing something that lands them at a finance agency or their CX experience means they're going to be really valuable somewhere else. And so I think that that's also, we're doing a little bit of the mapping for you. Um, Yeah. I think one example that is a few years old, but I would be surprised if much has changed. There was one hiring process that I ran for government kind of for coding it forward. And we'd actually put in the application process, like, Hey, here are the agencies we think we're going to be working with. Can you stack rank which ones you would prefer? Because it makes my life easier to be like, all right, you prefer these. And what we got with was just information that was not helpful. I think we had 75 to 80 percent of people say they wanted to work for the State Department. <laughs> and like we dug deeper, and we're like, talk to people and tell me about your interest in foreign policy. I'm like, oh no, that's just the only agency I've heard of. They've watched Madam because Secretary. it's yeah. in the news. <laughs> it's in the news in a way that is much more salient than. A Bureau of Labor Statistics or GSA. But if you're a data scientist, odds are there's probably a lot more data for you to play with at BLS. Or if you're an engineer, GSA is going to be a much more fruitful place than the State Department. So I think, again, that just goes to show you how can we, how can fellowship programs like ours put the onus on us to help you navigate where might be the best fit for your interest, your skills, and your experience? 
And I think also on the partnerships front, you bring up something interesting. So you mentioned that, for example, the AI executive order. And so both of our programs are mentioned explicitly in the AI executive order around the talent search. There's lots of agencies that are mentioned really explicitly in the AI executive order. So depending on, my fellows would laugh if they were watching this. I say it depends a lot because it really does depend. But there may be, you know, initiatives that come up and we're sourcing agency partners who really desperately need talent and maybe don't have the chance to really line up a recruitment strategy to get amazing data scientists in to help with something or AI ML experts. Um, Similarly, for a program like us, we've been around for a while now. As I mentioned, you know, we've seen a lot of folks stick around. There's some benefits to us of having, you know, the, the current CTO at the VA is an alumni of the PIF program, as one example. So we know that the VA is a place that has been really fantastic for us to place PIFs. We have built lots of amazing relationships. We know folks that have, you know, created opportunities for PIFs to really flourish and build great portfolios and have high impact. And so I think that that's another thing that's been really fantastic, but it gives us some flexibility. We're able to work with folks who maybe have an interest or a need one year and don't another or are trying to do something new and really need the staffing um, that a fellowship program offers. A little wonky, but we don't require headcount at the agencies that we work with. The headcount sits at GSA. And so money and staffing being what they are, sometimes you have more money, but you don't have the headcount. And so we can make that happen for you. We're the headcount. We're doing the hiring. And so often it's a way to test out something or see what it might look like to build out a discipline or in the case of AI, where it's not as fully staffed in government, what do you even need? You know, who do you need? Can you have somebody come in and talk about what it looked like to set something up in the private sector or set something up at another agency? And I think when I think about what's been great for agencies is one of our PIFs who actually is heading off to take a full-time role herself was called a force multiplier. And I think that that's where we see PIPs. It's less just getting a headcount in and it's agencies look at us as, oh, what else could we do? And similar with Chris, I imagine it's saying, you know, if we bring in digital core, I wonder who else might then be interested in applying. I wonder how else we can grow our early career pipeline. I wonder who else we can tap into. And so I see it as a more of an exponential, less like a filling a slot for an agency because of the way we function. But it's also a two-sided coin and it's a, in, a, in a good way, right? Because the availability of what you can provide for an agency also helps them think about what their strategic priorities are from a tech standpoint Mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe thinking about, oh, now is a good time to actually start building those capabilities and modernizing our data infrastructure and thinking about, but I want to also make sure we cover is AI. And so uh, as you, you work with a lot of agencies and there's a lot of really interesting problems in mission sets that your teams get to to spend time working on. How have you seen the AI conversation evolve? And and uh, you know, Marissa, I'm looking at you because you just launched your first cohort of AI fellows, which was really exciting. And so I'd love to hear about what you both are seeing on the ground in terms of how the federal government is um, preparing for AI, what kinds of human capital investments they're, they're making and how they're able to leverage your programs. Sure. And I also just want to shout out uh, Chris and the Digital Core brought on their third cohort, which was heavily AI and AI enabling. And so again, we're doing a lot of stuff at the same time, just different levels of career paths. Um, But so I think what's been interesting, and I want to give them the new AI cohort a huge shout out. One, check out our website. There are 11 folks who came in in June um, as a direct result of the AI executive order with some just really phenomenal backgrounds. Um, They are not the first AI pips we've ever had. So I also want to mention that, that even with the executive order, everyone who's coming in, there are people who have been doing all kinds of technology and government, maybe called something else, maybe in a basement for a very long time. And so I also just, we always encourage PIFs and digital core folks, I'm assuming too, to, you're not the first, you're building on the shoulders of other folks. There are amazing people who have been here building the foundation for lots of work and you're coming in to add to it and to help spur it along, not to move fast and break things. Uh, Move carefully and fix things, I believe is the, the infamous civic tech sticker that floats around. Um, but what I think has been interesting for these folks is they are looking at the executive order. So I'll give an example of, you know, their inventorying use cases of AI across government. And our folks are now in a pretty unique position to 11 of them get together every week and talk about what they're seeing at their agencies and exactly this. They're two months in. They're hearing things about inventorying of use cases. They're talking about governance. They're looking at the first rounds of things that are required by all agencies as a result of the executive order. 
And that means not nobody has the roadmap. The roadmap is being built as things are coming out. And so I think that that's a pretty interesting thing for folks who maybe have worked on things that are a little bit farther ahead in the private sector um, to come in and say, okay, we're starting at a different point here. You know, we can help to build this roadmap. We can help to understand the similarities across agencies. We can compare notes, which is, I think, something that, you know, even in private sector doesn't always happen across silos. And I think is even more rare in government. And so I think that these cohorts of folks, um, there's also a new group at DHS um, founded by a friend of the show, if you will, um, called the DHS AI Corps. Same thing. They're going to be working on numerous problems across DHS. That means you're not reinventing the wheel with every single problem. That means you're having a truly collaborative approach to the work. Um, we're also lucky to have the PIP alum who's serving as one of the senior AI policy advisors at the White House, who has been really instrumental in making sure that PIPs and their partners are all at the table, that we're being partnered with agencies who not only need us, but want us <laughs> to help do that work and to help guide those things. Um, and I think that they're seeing that in some cases, you're not maybe as far along as you think you are or would like to be, and that's okay. I think one of the biggest lessons that PIPs learn and folks who are newer to government, I know we have a mix here, is that it's not always bad that government's slow. It means that you have to be, you know, I'm trying to think about the framing that uh, Dr. Prabhakar, who's the head of OSTP, used for us recently. You want to be able to use the technology and you want to be able to push it, but also maintain your risk and opportunity balance pretty carefully when you're working for the public. And so I think that that's also a really interesting lesson. I think often private sector PIPs can push folks a little bit farther to say, like, can you consider this? Can you look at this? And their government partners are there to remind them that there's 300 million people who need to not have their lives broken by emerging technology. And so I think that that's been a really great balance for our PIPs uh, to see what's coming up. But then to add to that, the folks who were here before, we've got two folks, one who's been at CDC and one who's been at NIST, who've been now doing this work for several years. And so they're really able to say, here's how my agency has been managing something like the risk management framework to come out of NIST where we've had a PIF for several years, or generative AI guidance at CDC. And so there's different building blocks that are coming to fruition at different times, at different agencies, that then can be lent across. And I think that, honestly, I come back to the convening. It's the talent that PIFs have, and it's also truly their ability to connect and collaborate and not be so siloed all of the time. I might say something that is blasphemous for an event that is titled AI plus careers. But I'm ready. I, I, I'm ready. <laughs> But, but I think um, to some extent, kind of this current energy item around AI is a helpful Trojan horse in a way to talk a lot about just fundamentals in government. And one thing that I've been just beating the drum on is I don't think we have all the fundamentals and the building blocks to go from zero to 60, zero to 100 and just say, hey, if we wanted to do AI in the way that a lot of people traditionally understand it, that we're able to do it, right? So kind of being saying, hey, if you want us to be able to deliver on the promise of AI, we got to get the building blocks right. We got to have databases. They've got to be able to talk to each other. We have to be confident in where data is coming from. Is it clean? Is it representative? Whatever that might be. Without just jumping immediately to the end, because there's some notion of, hey, today, all the hype and all the energy and all the momentum is around AI. The same thing could have been said five, 10 years ago about something else. Um, the CX executive order? And there, <laughs> it, so, yeah, cyber was the last big <laughs> Cyber was customer experience. Yeah. I mean, there were people who were selling blockchain for X a no. whole. Oh, don't, don't right. mention the blockchain. And, and so, <laughs> <laughs> so, to some extent, if this ends up being something that blows over, like <laughs> we might all have different opinions on if it will. If we can, in the meantime, have solved some of the more underlying problems of why technology and data and AI is broken in government, that will be a positive thing. And so when I think about the AI work that our fellows do, a lot of it falls under that AI enabling bucket. What are the things that we have to do to enable AI? And that might not be all the transformers and training and learning the models. But if we do get into AI, right, I, I think about our work in a couple of buckets. There is safety and security, right? Whether that is a responsible AI toolkit and test cases before we deploy, whether that is red team models and thinking about rights impacting uses of artificial intelligence. There's a whole bucket there. Marissa mentioned a lot about use cases. You can find every agency's public AI use case by just Googling 
Department of Homeland Security, AI use cases. They are now mandated to publish that and keep that pretty up to date about what exactly we're using uh, these models for. And then some of our fellows at the State Department, for example, have contributed to AI models that are in deployment and that are actively saving. I, I think one estimate was over 200,000 hours of person time every year in the collection, research, translation, fact-checking of certain mandatory reports that go to Congress around international human trafficking and religious freedom in helping diplomats at uh, U.S. embassies and posts overseas do more effective media monitoring that is both context-specific in languages that are much more varied than just English. And so there's so many ways that what AI looks like in government, but I think, again, not just going all in in that bucket, but what is that broader umbrella of AI enabling work that our fellows are doing? Um, Marissa's mentioned the AI executive order, which is like one of admittedly the beefiest executive orders I have ever seen. Um, <laughs> Literally and for like you should, <laughs> if, you haven't, long, yeah. if you haven't read it from top to bottom, it could be worth the read. There are also tools, so I hear that can summarize it. For <laughs> so, um, look for those, but another kind of piece of policy and guidance that has really impacted how AI is being thought about and used at agencies is a memo that the Office of Management and Budget put up. Um, so if you Google M2410, that is a directive from the White House instructing agencies on how they should be using AI for their internal purposes. And so that has been a really core uh, document as well. So. I don't even remember what the question no, was. <laughs> I would add though too, and I think I love, I'm going to steal this line the next time I'm not speaking with you around the Trojan horse. I think it's also around, you know, change management and culture and really mm-hmm. finding out, I am kind of queen of the dad jokes sometimes, but I think that there is a little bit of, you know, technologists needing to help government figure out how to spell AI before they use AI. What are the building blocks and the fundamentals? Why? I think, you know, we hear folks come in even from our agencies and they say, you know, so-and-so wants to use HR, AI and HR. And we're like, that's a weird question. What do you want to do with your AI? Like it's a tool. It's not do AI. It's what do you want to accomplish in HR? And is AI a tool that you can use to accomplish that? And so I think that that's often also what technologists are able to do is help to suss out what is the goal? What are the objectives? What are the problems? And then what's in the toolbox, whether it's AI, whether it's, product, you know, thinking, whether it's any of those things. And I think that that's, I always look for folks as PIPs who aren't just doers, but are folks who can bring other people along with them, not to start a cult, but, you know, convince them of different ways to approach the work or to think about things or different ways to approach an emerging technology, because it's not, you're not always ready for the doing. You need to talk about it. You need to think about it. You need to explore it and really understand it. No, it's process. It's critical. Yeah. I would throw this out there on that. Uh, as as one of the guppy guys. <laughs> but yeah, sorry, we, we we had done some intros before we hit record. So if you would you yeah. be willing to stay? Oh here? yeah, I, I'm I'm Nick Ashworth again. Um, I'm from DDS. Uh, one of the things that I think is unique in this, I kind of throw to you guys as as sort of bait is so much of the federal government throughout our history, kind of going back to the fundamental part of the discussion, is teaching humans to act like machines. Like we, we as the federal government love, love to make people act like machines. You see it on our emails. You see it on how we use acronyms for everything. You see it on how we name everything. And with generative AI, generative AI in particular, like looking at like natural language processing stuff, we're finally at the point where we can have machines act like people and flip that on its head. And so like, I think for a lot of the agencies, whether you be looking at DOD, whether you be looking at like some of our, our more public facing federal agencies, the excitement there isn't so much about like data labeling or of like, you know, hey, look at this new rag implementation that lets you read all these documents from 30 years ago that I never wanted to read to begin with. <laughs> um, but is instead like, hey, uh, I finally have the chance to make this cumbersome system talk back to me. Like USA Jobs is a great example of that, where there's uh, multiple agencies now that are looking at like, how do I use AI to uh, either generate uh, better descriptions for USA job categories or actually do chatbots to explain to you what the hell this category actually is that you're looking at. Um, and that's where like, I think it's very exciting in this space because like 
we've had we've had like the the you know the hype train before on like cyber like oh we need to do cyber everything and we're going to teach everyone to be hackers and we're going to do all the data labeling and stuff and we're going to integrate everything and it never really works and never really goes anywhere because like it doesn't actually help anything like if you look at the cornerstone of the deal of cornerstone of the government in general i guess i should say is like how do i help you do things getting the machine to talk to you and getting like the system that is the government to talk to you in English and not in acronym stupid words yep. is kind of the core part of that. And, and that's and- why I've been so impressed. We bring a lot of designers in and so does digital core. And I think to be honest, before I was in more of a tech space, you probably would have asked me like designers, I would have been like a graphic designer, what? And really thinking about the human centered aspect of the work and that the technologists that we bring in again are focused on the not how do we use AI, but what do we want to do and who needs that and why do they need that and how do they need to receive that? And that is AI the tool for it. I come back to like the thought process. And I think that, you know, we, when I think about PIF, we've been talking a lot about our core values and, you know, presidential, we think about servant leadership, right? Not come in, move fast and break things. We think about innovation and that's people-centered innovation, like actually about humans, not just how do we make the biggest AI bot in the DOD or whatever we want to say. And, you know, fellowshipping about the community and collaboration. But I think that that really is the bigger question. It's, I think that a lot of government, and we've seen this in contracts, we've seen this with all kinds of things. It's, you know, use the tool, do the thing, but why? Who wants it? What's it going to do for somebody? Whose life is it going to make easier if they can all of a sudden understand what they're applying for on USA Jobs? or get access to, and we've been hearing a lot about folks working at the USDA. How do you get access to the benefits that you deserve? And how can technology better enable folks to get access to the government services that they deserve? And I think that you make a great point about that. And I think ideally that's what we want to see technologists who are human-centered and also not profit-motivated, which I think is a pretty cool opportunity. It's coming in, it's not how do we keep the market, it's how do we make the services better for people? And I think that that's been a really unique opportunity for folks to come in and ask hard questions that maybe haven't been asked or haven't been a part of that process or user research hasn't been incorporated, whether the user is the employee or the public into like, why would you want to use AI in the first place? <laughs> Not to slap AI on something. Okay, uh, yeah, I, sorry. I, mean, I want to just yeah. ask one more question before opening it up, but please do. Yeah, so even just to respond to the hypothetical of, hey, we've got these really dense policy documents, we've got these really dense job postings, maybe AI can translate into something that someone can understand. And I think in that notion, whatever that is, right, whether it's generative AI that's just synthesizing the corpus and and predicting something coming out, I would almost propose the actual question is, why is that policy document so dense in the first place? Why why do we need it to You're be opening translated? A can of words. It is. I'm like, this is an open can of words. There, there has been efforts around plain language. There's yeah. been an effort to kind of have all government communication be written at a reading level that it does not require someone had three master's degrees, like <laughs> that does not require that level of education because we know that it's not where the public is. And so I think there's an element of that. There's a lot of, on that. that also, by the way, please event. come talk to me. We clearly yeah. have lots of opinions, yes. both well, official and otherwise. So, <laughs> but that's good. I, and no, these are all, but like you said, these are all important questions that we should raise and are long overdue. And so the fact that we're able to have these conversations and people are talking about it in, in circles, OPM is very aware of how uh, they'd like to see some of the processes. There's improved. a big hiring memo that just came out. Huge. It's awesome. It's it, it's a huge deal and it's fantastic. Everybody should go look at it. Uh, one more question before I open it up is uh, talking about solving really hard problems that are critical to the future of public administration. It's critical to national security. We all want to get involved. Can you talk a little bit about the application process for your programs who would stand out as a competitive applicant, what you're looking for, and also to bring back a question from earlier in the chat, um, are there opportunities for um, foreign nationals? Let you start. I will answer the easy question first, which is unfortunately not. Almost every job, all of, all of ours included, are restricted not just to, um, to US citizens. Um, USA jobs will say US citizens and nationals Nationals, American Samoa and yeah, uh, residents of American Samoa and the Swains Islands, Thank you so um, much. which I believe are just hundreds of people. Um, so 
permanent residents, DACA recipients, unfortunately, are ineligible for almost all federal roles that you'll see. Um, that's just kind of a hard and fast thing that restriction okay. gets set way above our pay grades. And so when it comes to at least the digital core, I describe our selection process as an open book test. We are very open about what it is that we look for. If you go to our website at digitalcore.gsa.gov, you'll see it spelled out in excruciating detail because I think what we are trying to do is level the playing field between people who spend all their time on USA jobs and really have kind of an innate understanding of how the process works and people who are maybe considering public service for the first time. So on our website, you will see that spelled out and that is part of our work at every stage along the process. And before the application goes up, we also have info sessions. Part of our goal being a candidate, delivering a really good candidate experience is humanizing what it means to work in public service, right? A lot of people have this conception that government is just this big faceless bureaucracy that kind of sets up here. I want people to go through our process and understand that government is just made up of people. It is made out of people that look like you, that come from some backgrounds, and you can go through that. The digital core hires in one cohort a year that allows us to build kind of that community that we've been talking about. People move through the same sets of experiences together, and you kind of have battle buddies, so to speak, or people who can celebrate the highs, but also commiserate when uh, you're going through a little bit of a rough patch because sometimes that is just the reality of working in government. So typically what that means is fellows will start every summer. We actually just swore in our third class of fellows last Monday. Thank you. We're, we're thrilled to have them. And so they start in the summer because that allows people who graduate in the spring to be able to kind of transition pretty naturally into a role. Applications will typically open in the fall of every year. So um, if you're a senior and you're last year in your graduate program, you can apply typically sometime between September and November. And then we'll go through a selection process so that sometime ideally early in your spring semester, you've got a job offer in hand. And then we can actually go through some of that security and background investigation process, have plenty of time to let that process before you start with us kind of as a cohort. So that is the way that our process is set up. Again, it is very candidate centered. I like to say that we're very transparent. We will over communicate <laughs> so that no one has kind of one canonical USA jobs experience, which is, hey, I applied to a role. I never heard anything. I forgot I had even applied. I have started another job and Eight five months later, months later you. <laughs> you get called and like, hey, you've got a job. I'm like, oh, I don't God. even remember applying. But like we will, and we will try, and I can't say that we like do this perfectly, but like ideally every two weeks, you'll hear from someone on our team, even if the update is a non-update, I mean, like, hey, we're still working, we're at this stage. We will try to make sure you know where you are at every point along the way. That's right. And you're I'm very similar. I mean, I think we are dealing with a different um, applicant pool. So we aren't structured to a school year quite in the same way, I will confess. We have changed our timelines a few times in the last four years since I've been here. I myself would love to land on a perfect one. I'll let you know when that happens. Um, this year, we are expecting to open applications in the next few weeks. Um, if you take a look at our website, it's actually listed as upcoming. One of the great things that TTS, our home office does, is if you check out jointts.gsa.gov, you'll see both roles that are open and roles that are upcoming. It lets you kind of do some pre-planning. And I think both Digital Core and PIF like to do as much upfront work as possible. So it's not just cool job, but you have to apply in the next 72 hours or it's going to close, panic, panic, which also happens with lots of federal jobs. Um, we like to do the same. I think that the demystifying is really important. Again, if you found PIP on USA Jobs and you saw IT specialists, nobody's going to be like, that's the coolest job I've ever heard of. I can't wait to apply. It's just not going to happen. But where we can set it up is by, again, like Chris said, bringing in folks to talk about what does it actually mean for them? What's been in it for them to do this? And I think that especially for senior folks, you may be stepping away for one or two years from something that has a much clearer trajectory. We won't lie. We do our absolute best to pay the best that we can, given the constrictions of the federal government, channeling a former PIF who would go, the benefits are great if she was here, because that's what she always did for me. Um, but, you know, it's a big choice for folks at that stage in their career. So we want to make sure that we're engaging with people in such a way that, one, 
we can help them figure out if it's a good fit for them, because in all honesty, it's not a great fit for everyone. I think that PIF is pretty unique and that we ask folks to be uncomfortable with a lot of ambiguity. It's not a traditional FTE role. Your, descript- your roles are not clearly laid out all of the time and like, here are the 10 things you will do. The priorities of your agency may change while you're there. If you haven't noticed, it's an election year anybody, things are going to change. And, you know, we really ask that folks come in with a senior leader mindset that you're there to help advance the needs of your agency at that time. And that could mean doing lots of discovery. That could mean pivoting. That could mean budgets changing. That could mean your senior leadership changing. Um, And so you can be an amazing, talented technologist, and we hope you find an amazing role in government. And PIF may not be it for you because it's a little chaotic. On on, on, (laughs) on that kind of setting expectations. Yes, we do. That's what, right. In kind of answering the question of what makes a candidate yes. stand out, I think if the expectation, or <laughs> let me start, what makes a candidate stand out is at some point, the, the technical skill set, the expertise that you have in machine learning, in data science, in analytics, or engineering, if you're front end, back end cloud, whatever it might be, that is almost at some point table stakes. We expect people to have that technical foundation. But if you're coming in and your expectation, there are very rarely roles where 100% of your time will be spent. If you're an engineer where 100% of your time is going to be actually writing, testing, and debugging, running code. And if you're a PIF, that's like 5% of your time. And a lot (laughs) of the challenge that you'll find is that the things that are really going to be the barriers or people policy and process. And so to be really comfortable realizing that your technical skill set might manifest in ways of asking really productive questions at meetings of why are we building it in this way and not necessarily being the person that is building the thing. And so when it comes to skill sets, being kind of in the 99.9 percentile as an engineer, but in the 10th percentile as someone that can handle some of the non-technical engagement, whether it's communication, stakeholder management, and wrangling the bureaucracy. I think from our perspective, you're a much stronger candidate if you have really kind of strong, and I avoid calling them soft skills because they are as crucial, if well, not well, What would crucial. be a good name for those skills? I call them non-technical skills. So okay. you've got the technical skill set, the non-technical skill set, and you got to have both because mm-hmm. um, so much of the work. Um, There are roles in government where if you are just wanting to be swimming in data and like that is the one thing that you can do. But the reality is so much of the operational, the building of the tools in government often gets contracted out to vendors and government gets left kind of directing projects and programs. And that is where the wrangling and stakeholder management and the presentation skills are much more important. So I think a candidate our process does not just test your ability to write the code and ship a feature. Our ability is like, hey, how can you translate a technical topic to a deputy secretary who might not have any under, he, they, she may have heard AI in the news, but does not understand the difference between generative AI and linear regression, right? And like, how, where are we and how do we navigate that? And they may also need feedback from somebody who's not trying to climb the ranks. They may need to hear honest things from people. I think that, you know, a senior advisor, whether you're in the private sector and serving as someone's chief of staff or you're a senior advisor in government, you need to have the ability to have hard conversations with people about what's not working or about that somebody's not on board with something. I hear a lot of my PIFs talk about being able to give cover to really brilliant career civil servants whose voices maybe aren't being heard. You know, you've said the same thing over and over again, but they need a different, fresh voice to say it. And they might be trusted because they come from some jazz hands, fancy company in the private sector. Um, I've often said to folks, too, that you need a pretty interesting combination of humility and ego (laughs) to come in and work in technology and government. I think Chris nailed it on the people, process and policy. You're really going to be working on those things above technology. The technology is kind of like the byproduct of it. But if you're going to be introducing new technology into government, it's changing hearts and minds. It's changing budgets and dollars. And it's changing the Byzantine rules that we all get to read every day um, so that people can, again, come back to like getting the services that they need and deserve from the federal government. So I think we also look for folks who aren't coming in with the technology as a Band-Aid approach. You know, if somebody's telling us in an interview just about the pure technical aspects of something they did, I want to hear more about how it was a more inclusive product that they designed. I want to hear how they navigated a huge challenge or if they 
had a, you know, a tough ethical thing that they needed to debate when they were thinking about data privacy. I want to hear about how they convinced somebody to do something that maybe wasn't going to be the most profitable for their agency. I want to hear about those harder, stickier, people-focused things. Um, and again, somebody who, I mean, we all say what we want people to hear in an interview, but I do think that when you're looking at certain jobs, be honest. You want to be in a job that is that has the energy and the kind of structure or not structure that works for you. And I think if can be uniquely challenging on that front. I call it a choose your own adventure. We're bringing in senior folks who can definitely follow instructions and also write some instructions and also translate and some you instructions. when say senior versus early career, do you have a definition for that? So PIF is pretty interesting on that front. And I think we see, so this is one big difference. And Chris was talking about this earlier. Uh, Digital Core hires um, between one and two years out of an undergraduate or graduate program, correct? Is that how you define it right now? Um, it is. A little bit more nuanced. Thank it you. is also Go spelled out in excruciating detail. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, like That's very, right. very, very open about this. Uh, folks can apply in their last year of their program up to two years out from graduation. That can be an associate's undergrad, bachelor's, uh, or professional uh, PhD. Um, up to two years out from graduation. If you're a military veteran, those folks have six years to apply. Um, so there is a huge range between folks for whom about 80% of our fellows are first time federal slash government employees, which is really cool. Um, and there's about a 50 50 mix between people who are coming in with kind of a bachelor's or associate's degree as their highest level of educational attainment, and the other half coming in with the graduate degree and perhaps some work experience under our belt. So if we looked at just directly how many years of work experience, mm -hmm. it like is a little bit varied. But we have always designed the digital core. So that people who are coming out of an undergraduate degree or associate's degree and don't have full-time work experience, that like they can be found qualified for a job. I think the fact that we have many more people who have some years of experience under their belts applying and, and becoming digital core fellows, we love to have them. But the reality is, I mentioned earlier, we're building kind of the first and second rungs of that career ladder. PIF is really up here, and you know, they, they've reached the rafters, and there's a gap in the middle. And mm -hmm. I think what we're seeing is some of the folks who might come in at slightly kind of a junior to mid-journeyman person level aren't finding anything there, and so they're dropping that down. So Interesting. And I would say for us, I mean, PIF one, and again, I know we have a mix of folks who have done FED or looked at FED. Read the specialized experience and the minimum qualifications on the job. PIF is pretty unique in a few ways. One, there's no educational requirement. I know somebody's talking about being a hacker. We love folks who have come in from maybe more non-traditional backgrounds. Um, so there's no educational requirement for PIF. Um, and I think that, again, it's less of the early career building block and more of the bring folks along with you. So if you look at our specialized experience, it's not live yet for this cycle, but it's more on the senior leadership side. You won't see there being like requirements for, you're not going to take a coding exam as a PIF. You may be asked to walk through a case study, but I have a lot of PIFs who I see really ambitiously put coding time on their calendars. And I'm like, well, I'm going to schedule over that. That's not happening for you right now. Um, because it's just a different level. So I think we, one of the benefits I see to PIF though, is it crosses a huge range of professional experiences. We have folks who are retired CEOs who come back and take a role as a PIF. We have folks who may appear to be more junior in their career, but have navigated their work with a significant amount of leadership experience, a significant amount of ambiguity. They may have been founders. They may have done a wide variety of things. So I always encourage you, while it is different than the private sector, where you can sometimes skate by with 50% of what's on your resume uh, matching the job description, make it match, but read it carefully and see in what ways you actually do match. I think the language can often be confusing, but we lay out clear specialized experience and minimum qualifications, and we want you to tell us the story. I think like that's the rule, too, for all federal resumes, like minimum, and then tell us everything we need to know. I can't Google you. So you might have some incredible stuff out there, but if there's something you want us to know about your experience or your background, make sure it's in your resume so that we can take a look at it. Um, and then finally for us, you know, we are bringing in polymaths. I want to know all of the interesting stuff you're into, all of the different things you've worked on. We've seen physicians come in uh, to PIF I, we, and who have stayed on. We've seen folks who have come in and decided they want to rise in leadership positions or have come from managerial positions. We see folks who want to be ICs or individual contributors forever. 
And all of those are fine. There's not really a cookie cutter mechanism, but I think a lot of the things that you'll see outlined in our specialized experience lay out kind of those higher level non-technical, I hate calling myself non-technical. I'm non-technical too, but like non-technical skills that are really required to come in at that senior advisor level. So we're um, about to wrap up the recording portion for our online um, guests. Uh, So thank you everyone so much for joining us. Just, uh, and for everybody in the room, please stick around. We'll keep networking, uh, have some refreshments. Yes, because I was going to have a closing lightning round of advice you want to give people who are considering public service, who are thinking about how AI could affect their job prospects um, as either a technologist or a non-technologist, but who are thinking about um, making a early or mid-career transition into public service and the effect that technology could have on their prospects. So closing thoughts and also just throwing that out there. Fun fact, we are going to be hiring for a director of the PIF program. So if you know somebody who's looking for a big challenge, wrangling a lot of very smart, big personalities, we want to hear from them. There's an info session on Friday. Um, I'll share that information with Diana, who maybe can send it out. Yeah. And I think two pieces of advice, one more from my perspective, which is Please apply for roles in technology, even if you're quote unquote non-technical. I fall into the non-technical category and we need everybody to be in that work. So I don't think you could have told event producer me from a decade ago that this is what I would be doing, but I think I contribute in some pretty powerful ways. So tell your friends, even the folks who aren't here. Um, And I think from the technical perspective, it's come in with what I said, a healthy combination of ego and confidence and humility and servant leadership. We need both. You need to come in believing you can work on hard things and also not thinking that you're the best in the world when you come in to do it. I work with some pretty brilliant people who have been here for a long time. I mean, (laughs) you all are here, right? And so you've taken a step, however Mm -hmm. small it might seem. And so I would just encourage you find a role, toss your hat in the ring, all the better if it's one that has a shared certificate or pulled hiring or a fellowship-based program so that you get multiple cracks at the apple and you have kind of a more cost-effective way of (laughs) applying to jobs. And I would say once you're in the federal government, once you're in government, DOD might be some similar thing. It becomes a lot easier to understand kind of who's doing interesting work. And so don't put all the pressure on yourself to have that first role be a perfect role. The first role gets you 75% in the right direction. You can always pivot from there. And so many government postings are internal reassignments or only open to other federal employees. So get your foot in the door, toss your hat in the ring. There are a lot of people that will help out. Um, Yeah. Great advice. Please join me in thanking our fantastic. We're going to end the recording now.